Kingman, and I am honored to represent the uh, Blayton Alumni Association and the Office of Institutional Advancement, which sponsors these events known as Breakfast of Blayton. Just want to remind you that we are going to start off next year with a special edition of Breakfast of Blayton. Ann Staffney will give a report on the Blake Schools on September 1st at the Unicata Club, so keep your eyes open for an email about that. Well, to introduce Nick today, who is a good friend and a, and a guy that I've had to know well over the last couple of years, uh, there's really something a whole lot better than that is, is history teachers and mentors who has played years here, so I'm going to turn the over. Thanks, Woody. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Woody for continuing to make these events possible. I hope uh, this is the second time this week that I've had a chance to introduce a hero of mine. Uh, and uh, Nick spoke to the Blake Upper School on Tuesday. Uh, and told them about his decision as a member of the class of 1999, postponed college, and joined the Marines, and how that decision has affected his life journey. I tried to offer some context from the point of view of an older person who was one of Nick's teachers. I came to Blake uh, in the fall of 1962. I had recently left the U.S. Army, uh, Chuck Ritchie at that time was in language school up in California on his way to Korea. Uh, the other teachers who were hired that year were Bill West, a West Pointer who had served in combat in Korea, and Jimmy Ola, an Annapolis graduate who had served extensively in the Pacific. Many members of the faculty at that time had been in the service. Uh, in the 1960s, Blake seniors all registered for the draft with the understanding that they might well serve or in some way they would have to deal with the fact of a war in Vietnam. Uh, the question of military service was not remote to them. The possibility of ending up in Vietnam was real and we were all affected. We knew people uh, who were uh, in one way or another attached to that war. 1999 offered a different landscape and most Americans had little direct relationship to the military. 9-11 changed that in some ways. Nick left the Marines uh, for a while and, and then returned after had to serve two tours in Iraq. He will share that story and the story of his return to civilian life and how he has worked to help other military folks return to uh, civilian life with all sorts of baggage and needs. Uh, it is a great honor uh, to introduce to you uh, Nick Swell. Uh. Isn't Rod the best? Just one more for Rod. I, I mean, really. So last month, I was at a dinner party at some of my closest friends. Blake friends, actually. Friends that are sitting here in this room right now. And we play this, uh, this dinner question game that I like. So I'm, I ask these questions. If you could travel back in time and meet someone, who would it be? Or if you could compete in any Olympic sport, what would you do? Though most of you know me as quite the talker, I actually like to ask the questions and listen to my friends' answers. And best case scenario, I don't have to answer the question myself. And the final question of the night, the final question I still haven't answered, and that question was, what is the hardest thing you've ever done? And as I listened to my friends' answers, a montage of memories was playing through my head. Joining the Marines out of high school and making my parents upset? No. <laughs> Getting hazed and experiencing the infamous Code Red? 
which is simply being beaten up for no reason? Nope. Going to freshman year of college at age 20? Not even close. How about two tours in Iraq? I mean, what Minnesotan doesn't like 90 degrees and sunny? And not even climbing Mount Kilimanjaro with my family could compare to the hardest thing. Unequivocally, undoubtedly, the hardest thing I've ever done was not joining the military, but leaving it. But I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's back up to 1998. I was scheduled to graduate in May, and unlike the rest of the class of 99, I was literally the only person that didn't immediately have college plans. The summer prior to my senior year, I decided to enlist in the Marine Corps. On December 1st, 1998, I stood in the upper school's auditorium, and during my speech, I said these exact words. Quote, I was shown a path, a path that anyone who plans on being successful takes. For various reasons, I chose to stray from this path, and I'm here to encourage each and every one of you to examine if you should too. End quote. Oh no, well that was that part. For my part, I chose to blaze a new trail. I chose to commit myself to something new and unexplored by the Blake community. I chose to enlist in the United States Marine Corps. The Corps will give me a chance to test my physical and mental ability, to earn something for myself, and most importantly, to determine what kind of person I really am. So why did I do it? My wife Amanda, sitting up front, also a Blake grad, will tell you I did it because I am a little bit of a contrarian. My parents will tell you I did it for the adventure. I like to tell myself I did it because I wanted to prove that I could start from the bottom and work my way up. But as usual, I think the answer lies somewhere in the middle. So following graduation, I went to Marine Corps boot camp. And let me tell you, boot camp is full of interesting people. It consists of 13 weeks of what I would call indoctrination. And while I was at boot camp, my classmates at Blake were at freshman orientation. I learned how to march, how to get yelled at, how to shoot guns, but I also learned the true meaning of leadership. And that is, you have to help every person around you, both the strong and the weak. There was one kid, Oliveira, that I helped get dressed every single day. And I also began to realize that coming from Blake, I wasn't like the other Marine recruits. Some joined to avoid prison, others to avoid gang wars, others to get off the farm, and others because they simply had nothing better to do. Now, it's, I'm not really trying to say how great I am, but rather that a number of incredibly talented people, the Rod Andersons of the world, have invested a lot in me, and I owed it to him and to others to do my best. So what did I learn from this experience? Well, my first tour in Iraq, I partnered with the Iraqi police in the Anbar province. And in this photo, you can see the Iraqi policeman on the right. He's a Sunni from the small town of Anna. And my interpreter, a Shia from the metropolis of Baghdad. And as many of you are well aware, the Sunni-Shia schism is considered one of the greatest historical religious fractures. My interpreter, Ali Sadiq, is now an American citizen and remains a friend. My wife and I have visited him three times in Tampa, and I've flown him up here to spend the weekend with us in Minnesota. And while we spent a lot of time attempting to reconcile the differences between the Sunni and Shias, this consisted of many meals, and if you look closely, you can see the difference in apparel between the Sunnis and the Shias, represented by the Iraqi army in blue and the Iraq or in tan, and the Iraqi army in blue, and then the Marines wearing just the tan. So I'm not going to say we're successful, but I am going to tell you that I learned a tremendous amount about other cultures and myself. Now here's a photo of my best friend. Obeda Amer Idris with his two daughters. Have you ever had that experience where you meet someone and you just immediately have that mutual understanding and respect? That was Obeda and I. I mean, we learned each other's languages and each night I would study note cards. I ended up with a thousand note cards in a Ziploc bag that sit in my basement today. 
I still speak broken Arabic. And just last week, as I was driving down Highway 7, I saw a woman wearing a hijab, presumably from Somalia, broken down on the side of the road. Amanda and I stopped, and I walked up to her, and I said, Salaam Alaikum, with a customary greeting for Muslims. And that simple two-word sentence is the common language to break down barriers between cultures. If I hadn't had that experience in Iraq, I probably wouldn't have stopped. I probably wouldn't have put her at ease, and she probably wouldn't have thanked me for stopping and said, things are just fine. Go on your way to Andy Rich's Christmas, or actually uh, barbecue birthday party. Now back to Obeda. He's a very religious man, but that doesn't mean he hates Americans or Christians or Jews. No, he only wanted the same thing everyone wants. Safety for himself and his family and some level of prosperity. And after six months of working together every day and developing a large level of trust and respect, he actually invited me to his mosque. Now as, a, as an American soldier, I could not accept that because I would have been on the cover of CNN or New York Times the very next day. But he also invited me to his house to have, meet his family. So you might expect that I would simply walk in and shake hands with his wife and give his kids a gift and pat him on the head. No, that's not how it's done in Iraq. I had the house surrounded by Marines, and I walked in, and as I was being led to the hosting room, or in Iraq it's called a diwan, I saw a person at the back of the, at the, back of the hallway. And this person kind of cut across the hallway and glanced, glanced in my direction. Only later did I realize that that person was his wife. And his wife wasn't allowed to introduce herself to me, but that was her way of acknowledging my existence and my friendship with Obeda. Her risking breaking some level of social decorum by doing a quick dart across the hallway just to see this person that her husband had been talking about. And frankly, I was honored. Now I returned from that first tour ready to conquer the world. And oddly enough, the world has a way of changing the status quo. Again, I want to travel back in time to New Year's Eve 1999 because I love this photo so much. This was six months following my graduation from Blake, and this is my classmate and good friend, Amanda Allen, a picture that would be echoed 10 years later at a wedding in Boston. This is us reconnecting at the wedding in Boston in 2008. So following Dan Thorpe's wedding, a Blake friend who I was just with last night, Amanda quit her job in Minnesota, left her house empty and moved to the Marine base in California while I was preparing for my second overseas deployment. Now myself and all the Marines, we were excited to go back into the action where we thought it was going to happen in Afghanistan and we did not want to go back to the winding down war in Iraq. Well much to the dismay of my unit and myself, which conversely was to the joy of our families and friends, we ended up in a quiet tour on, in Iraq. Uh, I left after 10 months with Amanda to patrol the border of Iraq and Syria catching smugglers. Now let me tell you, most of the time, war isn't too glamorous. I saw some camels, I slept on the ground a lot, shot the breeze with my boss, hung out with some helicopters, uh, and my favorite, survived some sandstorms. So this is the middle of the storm, and we were stuck like this for three days. And one of my favorite photos was a selfie I took in 2009. That's the middle, this is the selfie. Now this is 2009, and I want it to be on record, this was four years before the Oxford Dictionary declared it a word. Now this next photo is what my bed looked like after a storm. So you can see my hands, I'm holding up the pile of sand that accumulated against me, that's about six inches of sand, and I would actually sleep wearing ski goggles. So, like most good stories, they have somewhat of a happy ending. I returned from Iraq and I proposed to my now wife, who is, as I mentioned, is scrolling these photos. But the story, the story doesn't end there. As I stated at the beginning, the return was the hardest thing I've done. And there are, there are two parts to this challenge. The first part was my inability to adjust to civilian life. The second part is the world's inability to understand me. 
I remember sitting at a restaurant with my wife and her friends, and they were talking about the latest fashion trends from Burberry and the music releases from Katy Perry. And honestly, I was completely lost in this conversation. I remember my eyes glazing over and thinking about how I wished I was wearing my body armor, had my helmet on, with my rifle, back in Iraq with my Marines. Now a year after I came home, my wife sat me down and she asked me to see a therapist, to work with someone on how I communicate with people. So I began to eliminate swear words. <laughs> I learned to stop asking for things by simply giving orders. And I distinctly remember coming home from my fast, fun, and friendly job at Target and asking my therapist, it's weird. Am I actually supposed to worry about hurting my coworkers' feelings? Now, I've come a long way from those days. I've mostly eliminated my swear words, well, except for when I'm talking to other Marines. I've, start, I've started to sport a Burberry tie, and I've even added Katy Perry to my Pandora list. But what about that second part? The world I was returning to. Well, how about we begin with some numbers? The percent of military participation has plummeted since World War II. And as you can see, from almost 10% to less than 1%. And if you'll note, the few spikes we've had were for the Korean and Vietnam War, yet we didn't actually have a spike during the global war on terror. Right now, about 7% of the population is a veteran. And the lion's share of these veterans are from the Korean or Vietnam War, are above the age of 60, and are out of the workforce. Somewhere around 3% of the working population is a military veteran. Now, in those high paying or white collar jobs, that number is even lower. Consider the well-to-do hamlet of Excelsior, Minnesota. Now the Excelsior Brewery has this program. It's a buy a beer for a veteran program. And this is how it works. So if someone walks into Excelsior Brewery, they can buy their beer, and if they choose, they can buy a beer for a veteran. They get to write their name, you know, from Bill to a U.S. Marine or to a Navy SEAL or to a veteran, and they put it up on this big board. So I went in there one day to enjoy a, a frosty cold one, and as the barkeep was handing me the uh, placard, I said, he mentioned to me, well, yeah, it's a cool program, but each month, the board fills up so much that we actually have to take them down and we don't give them to veterans. Now, of course, this tells me that Excelsior Minnesota supports the military, but it also tells you one other thing. This would never, ever happen at any place near a military base or with any sort of veteran population. Veterans simply aren't part of the landscape of the upper crust of Minnesota. And that trickle-down effect is a workforce with little empathy or understanding of their skills, backgrounds, strengths, and I will happily admit all of our weaknesses. So Rod mentioned what I'm doing now. Following World War II, the unemployment rate for veterans was half their civilian counterparts. In 2013, the unemployment rate for 9-11 veterans was double their civilian counterparts. As I hinted earlier, I believe these numbers reflect a lack of understanding between these veterans and employers. This has directly led to my current work. I connect companies with veterans and I help veterans explain their skills. For veterans, I created a program called Reverse Boot Camp. I work to undo some of the lessons they were taught. Like how you get a job. I mean, in the military, every three years, we are told to pack our bags and get ready for the next assignment. There's no job application. There's no resume writing. There's no interview. Thus, no skills are developed for the job hunt process. And ironically, many of the national veteran hiring programs might be doing just as much harm as they are doing good. Consider the rhetoric that politicians and others use when discussing this issue. And my personal favorite, is the White House's clever maxim. If a service member fights overseas, they shouldn't have to fight for a job when they come home. The unintended consequence is that veterans expect to get a, someone else to get a job for them. 
This is the very first thing that I seek to reverse. The second thing I do is help them change their language. I'm not talking about the proliferation of four-letter words, but the actual lexicon used. For example, when I started interviewing, or even my elevator pitch at a cocktail party, I used to simply say, I'm a Marine infantry officer. What else do you need? I'd kind of puff out my chest, because in the core, that means a lot. But I quickly realized that meant nothing. So, I pro so I'd proudly say, well, I'm an airstrike specialist. Still, blank stares. Finally, I started to say something like, well, I was one, of a, one out of a thousand Marines selected to attend a difficult certification school that requires strong geometry, project management, and prioritization of skills. Well, that happened to be airstrike school, but I think you understand the point. Yet getting veterans to change is relatively easy compared to helping the world understand us. For companies, I help them understand where they will and won't be successful. But this is where I need your help. Again, the basic premise of my argument is that veterans don't do a good job of integrating into society, and society, inherently, does not understand them. The current corporate solution relies a lot on technology. Hey, we'll just create a website or an app. This, it'll be great. This will fix it. Well, let me tell you a quick story about the phrasalator. The phrasalator, yeah, and that's actually the real name for this thing. This puppy was a technological solution to a human problem integrating US service members with indigenous people. So what you do is you'd speak English into this little black box, and it was supposed to translate into Arabic. Now this next photo is a good picture of how this actually played out. See the American isn't even looking at the people? There's absolutely no rapport or understanding. There is no salam alaikum to the woman in the hijab on Highway 7. Technology can solve a lot of problems, but they can't solve the human to human problems. Or, as I like to say, simply because you have thousands of Facebook friends, that doesn't mean you have any real friends. Oftentimes, it can become a hindrance to getting to substantive issues. But I do think people are definitely trying. Countless, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of times I've heard, uh, thank you for your service. Even following my speech at the high school on Tuesday, a group of jocks confidently walked up and shook my hand, thank you for your service. And most touchingly, an awkward young woman that looked like she belonged more at Berkeley instead of Northrop, braved the walk from the back of the auditorium to thank me. Now every time I hear this, I still blush, and I say the same thing. It's great, I get paid to work out and shoot guns. Yet I think the CEO of Starbucks, a non-veteran, got it exactly right in his book for Love of Country. He talks not only about thanking a service member, but then following up by asking them to tell their story. So you might wonder, how can I hear a veteran's story? Well, funny you should ask. Because when I challenge people to hire veterans, I usually get the response that, well, Nick, I can't change my company. I've even heard a, wait, you want me to take a risk and hire a veteran? Well, here's my recommendation. The next time you, any of you, have some sort of job opening, that you interview at least one veteran for that job, regardless of how qualified their resume says they are. You will learn a lot. Additionally, I think it's important for the Blake community to support the various routes people take. And no, I'm not rattling the saber for more military members, but like my senior speech originally stated, to continue to support all the different paths people take. It could be any of the service-related organizations, AmeriCorps, USAID, or Teach for America, that we at the Blake School continue to diversify our viewpoints and experiences in order to enable us to be excellent stewards of the common good. Veterans have some terrific experiences, but we definitely have some work to do in how we share them. Hopefully, our community will continue to both embrace us and seek to understand what we've done, thereby enabling a successful transition of those experiences. 18 years later, I will close with the exact words I used to close my senior speech. When all is said and done, the choices in life are yours to make. Remember to follow your heart, to chase your dreams, 
to be true to you. Remember the familiar words of Robert Frost, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sure. terrific. Thanks. Thank you. It's really great. I'm sure there's some questions for Nick, and we have some time. It's only quarter of seven, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got one in the back there. Thank you. My question to you, it makes sense in my mind for us to have a way for veterans to feel a part of our society instead of not. It's possible that we can find a community college, and we have one of the most outstanding in the country, where we can offer course opportunities for returning veterans that would give them an opportunity to feel part of society and at the same time understand what it is on the part of employers interested in the college and interested in the veterans and work up a way in which the veterans could be hired while they're going through the program. And my question to you is, what do you think it would take for us to be able to do that? Uh, so I think, did everybody hear the question all right then? I think so. Um, that, you know, it's a, it's a billion dollar question. What do, we, what do I think it would take to have veterans quickly tr uh, or be able to integrate into school and into kind of society. I'll tell you a quick story about my radio operator. I don't have his picture up here. His name's Jarrett Kubler. Uh, one of the smartest kids that I knew in the Marines, enlisted Marine, hadn't gone to college yet. Um, he was my right-hand man when I was in Iraq, set up my, you know, uh, VHF, HF, sorry, satellite radios and talked to planes, talked to ground forces. Um, definitely was, again, a huge, huge asset to me every day in Iraq. He went back to Arkansas and started at community college. And when I spoke to him after his, uh, his first semester, he said, hey, sir, it's funny, enlisted Marines, even though they're out of the Marine Corps, will still call you by your rank. Hey, sir, um, yeah, I, I, I went there and I just, I just did not fit in. I didn't fit in at all. Um, and I said, so, Jared, did, did you drop out of school? He goes, well, I finished the semester, but I didn't drop out. And I said, well, that's the same thing, Jared. But, um, so now I said, well, every, every, about every six to nine months, I get a call or a text from him. And, you know, he's, he's living in Arkansas, working at a liquor store, making minimum wage. And I, I told this to my wife a couple of years ago, and she saw me get really upset. And she said, well, Nick, you know, if you want to help him get a job up here, he can live in our basement. That's the level of commitment my wife understands that I'm willing to make. Now, do I think that what could have been done to prevent Jared from dropping out of school? I think you... A lot of schools are doing a lot better job of having a school counselor or someone dedicated to their kind of veteran community and having them come in. I mean, I've talked to so many service members who have gone to a school somewhere, their, it, their credits don't translate, they just don't fit in and they don't really know who to talk to um, and there isn't that person. But some schools have done a really good job of that. And oddly enough, not to indict the University of Minnesota, but they're actually one of the worst schools at this. Um, a bunch of the community colleges are doing really well. And uh, scarily enough, I'm sure maybe you guys have heard of this, some of the for-profit schools are uh, getting in a lot of trouble for manipulating veterans. So it, it's a dicey thing, and I think it's, it's back to people. I don't think you can say, I mean, yes, you gotta put somebody in charge of that group of people who are gonna bring them into school, but that person has to have the ability to interface with a bunch of different veteran experiences, help them understand, help them get through school, and that's a dynamic human being. Um, that can both kind of tutor, mentor, and guide these students. Um, and I think and typically that's a veteran themselves and they're probably having a hard time as well. So uh, long answer to a, a very, but that was a very challenging question. So if I had the answer, I'd, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. We'd be solved, this problem would be solved. So next question, we got one down here. Yes, um, based on what you said, I think you're a believer in national service. Would you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, Rod and I were talking after the speech on Tuesday and we talked a little bit about a uh, number of service members in Congress. And I looked up the stats and I have it, it's on my laptop. I, I tried to get it in here, but I couldn't figure out a way to make it work. 
But uh, we went from 75% in 1960 to less than 20% uh, right now in terms of congressmen who have served. So I'm not, I'm not talking, I know you're kind of asking about national service to other organizations, but I just want to point out every Congress that well, I was reading about, every single Congress has had less service members than the Congress before it. I think that uh, having people, you know, one of, one of the organizations that asked me for help, the president of this uh, real estate company, his son happened to be a Marine infantry officer and all of a sudden he gets excited about hiring veterans. I guess my point is that simply if you don't have a personal connection, you're not going to be interested. You won't be sitting in this room. And I know everyone, I'm talking to the preacher of the choir here because you're all here. You've self-selected into this group. It's like, how do I get in front of the people that didn't self-select, that aren't, don't desire to wake up early to come listen to some guy talk about veterans? Um, ultimately, I, I think back to your question, I would support any of the service organizations um, the AmeriCorps, the Teach for America, uh, those types of organizations, uh, because that's what I said to the Blake students on Tuesday. Don't join the military. Someone said, would you join the military? And I said, I never encourage anybody to join the military. That's a choice you have to make for you. Now, would I encourage people to explore all the different options out there? Absolutely. So that, I just wanted to put at least another option out there. So apologies if I didn't fully answer your question. Right here. So. Uh, right, so the question is, where are those places where veterans fit uh, quicker than others? So first I'll say, the oddest thing in the military is we have this thing, it's called combat arms, and that is like the people who are there to blow things up and break things. Inherently, we don't have that in the civilian world, the closest thing being you know, law enforcement, but they're still, they've, law enforcement, I don't know if you know this, has realized that our job is not to kill people and break things. If we do that, we get in a lot of trouble. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I think that a third of the military roughly composes of those combat arms guys. They have a, they have the hardest time, right? I, I remember I was down at uh, Walt Disney World, had their, had their Hiring Our Heroes event, and I sat in the back and I was listening, and uh, there was a, a person on stage, a public af Air Force public affairs officer, and she was talking about the challenge of going from Air Force public affairs to Walt Disney World public affairs. And I almost got up and left. Um, <laughs> because, so I think some people have those direct connections. It's, let's call it 70%. I think the 30% that don't, you know, the guys that, there are people who, we have IT people in the Marines. Like, they run Cat5 cable to your computers and plug them in for you. It's pretty cool. But uh, there are 30%, where do they fit? And I think a lot of them, I went to work for Target originally. It was a great role for me. Uh, you know, I was in charge of 40 people. We made sure the boxes went out on time. I was essentially a, you know, a platoon commander again, as we would call it. Um, I think there are some places, Amazon recruits a ton of veterans for their fulfillments in the operations sector. I think when you start to get out of that, um, that's when it starts to get a little bit tricky. I mean, marketing, convince someone that you know something about marketing when you come from the military. I mean, it's pretty hard to do. Finance, sure. I mean, we just spend money like it's cool. $600 billion the Department of Defense is, so we're not very good at finance, but... Uh, I, sorry, did I answer your question? Uh, right in the back here. Or right in the middle, right here. Yes, please. So the question is about Minsku and how is Minsku doing in integrating? And I think overall, they do a pretty good job. One of my really good friends works, she's an army soldier, uh, National Guard soldier, as a matter of fact. So they have liaisons to these people. And I think by and large, Minsku has done a, a pretty darn good job of both accreditation um, and just integration. I think, uh, like I said, it's, it's, a con it's like communication with your wife. I mean, it's never perfect, right? You're constantly working on it. Um, so I think... Is that good, honey? No? Oh, sorry. I communicate just fine with you. Oh. So she communicates fine. I am working on it. So. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I think by and large, Minsky does a good job. I mean, I think a lot of people are doing a lot of really good things. I think the challenge is who, 
how is each person kind of doing something, every person in here doing something today? That's kind of the challenge back. I don't want to indict individual organizations and say they're not. I'm simply saying it is a challenge. And especially in Minnesota, there are no major bases. We don't know a lot of people. Um, it's just we're a super, super minority here, as, as odd as that sounds. Uh, uh oh, Andy Rich? Oh. You didn't answer the question. Yeah. Oh, what was the question? Would you speak, would you speak for the people? What do I, what? Would you speak to her? Oh, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear that at the end. I would absolutely love to speak to <laughs> anyone that's willing to sit there and listen to me run my mouth. How about that? Andy. Uh, what are some of the differences and similarities Uh, that's a good question. I mean, officers versus enlisted, I didn't really talk about it, and Rod hinted at it when I, she said I took a break. So I was in college for four years during 9-11. I was actually still part of an ROTC program and still part of the military. It counts uh, towards my retirement, as a matter of fact. So uh, officers are the management, enlisted are the labor. So I started as an enlisted person, non-college educated. Um, officers have to have their bachelor's degree. Um, they're about 15% of the military, enlisted about 85%. So um, typically in this community, the people that we're gonna interact with around here are the officer types. Um, the people that work in enlisted are people who in the civilian side work kind of construction. Uh, that's, if that makes sense, is that a fair analogy? Or, or those of you who watch Downton Abbey, it's like the upstairs people versus the downstairs people. And it's the last stratification in American society. It is the most bizarre thing in the world that some people have to like stand there and put their hands behind their back and call me sir even though they're like 15 years older than me. And so when I do my marine, I'm still in the reserves, I'm a company commander, and when I do my marine stuff on the weekends, I mean I have these, these guys that are 48 years old that you know stand up and put their hands behind their back and call me sir and I'm, I'm 35 and it's just, it's a humbling experience now because being a civilian most 28 days a month and then I go do that for two days, it, it seems really weird. Um, but uh, to answer your question Andy, how many? Oh, we got one here, and I got some. Oh, one in the back, Mr. Shinkle. Uh, okay, so first off, I, I eliminated this from the, the speech. At one point I had talked about how most people's experiences with veterans are, uh, I've heard this before, in inter I've, I actually interviewed with someone where they said, Nick, I know veterans like I've seen the movies. And um, as I tried to point out, war isn't glamorous. I spent a lot of time sleeping on the ground, surviving sandstorms, and it's not like American Sniper. now. So anything you read in the media, I think we understand, is uh, sensationalized to some extent. Uh, if you want, go back and read my first interview with the Star Tribune two and a half years ago and tell me my life wasn't sensationalized by the writer. Um, so Google machine, you can find it and you'll be like, huh, that's weird. Now, talking a little bit about the VA, uh, I'm not an expert in the VA. I know my things went through just fine. I was talking to a woman who sells staffing to the VA. And she said something really interesting to me. And I, I know this is going to sound judgmental and bad, but you asked the question, Mr. Schinkel, and we're in a safe environment here. So she said that, uh, that the VA actually has more, so she sells staffing in terms of like where they, you know, how the labor software tool. And she said that the VA has more doctors and nurses per person than any other hospital in the country. Be, but she said, that, I said, well, why is it that they've seemed to be ineffective? And she said, it's because there are only a certain amount of people that are willing to go the, through the bureaucratic nightmare that is the application process to the VA. And all the good people get scooped up by HCMC, Mayo, and whatnot. And basically what you have left is the people who don't, won't go anywhere else. And that was actually her explanation. And I thought that was pretty interesting considering that she looks at the numbers of how many staff there are per person. And this isn't some writer trying to sensationalize a cover story for the New York Times. So um, I, I guess that's a little anecdote and a little bit of experience. I mean, I know they're trying to do better. I mean, it's such a hot button politicized issue that I, I don't know, I, I don't envy those people that work there. 
Um, sometimes I'm a little frustrated, but I, leading that organization, I, I would not want that because politicians use it, the media uses it. I mean, veterans are this, um, this weird topic of you have to support them, but then you can't, I mean, you can't just give veterans everything, right? I mean, I think that was part of my, or hopefully that was part of my speech. You can't give a veteran a job. They can't walk out of the military and walk into a job. We all know it doesn't work that way. And that is somewhat of the expectation of people um, is that, well, we should just give a veteran a job, but that's not doing them any favors. So, all right, question here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think for me as a 26-year-old infantry officer in Iraq, I slept with a box of $200,000 in uh, American cash underneath my bed. And, uh, you know, you come home and, and you have these incredible experiences where you're sitting with these, you know, these Iraqi leaders. And, you know, it's one of those experiences where I got there and I, real, I, I felt like I knew less when I left. The amount of things I didn't know exposed to me to the world. And I come back here... And um, I, want to, I want to bring these lessons places. And a number of people would say to me, well, Nick, like, how can you expect to start at the, uh, not start at the bottom? You know, you have no relevant experience. You, you never worked in Minnesota. I've heard this. You've never worked in Minnesota. I was, I was out to uh, lunch with a father of a Marine. This is what he said to me. We were talking about his son, who actually literally has the same name as him, Junior. I'm not going to say his first name but literally has the same name as me. He said, well, you know, Junior has this four-year hole in his resume. And I just looked at him. And I'm thinking to myself, so, and Junior went to Afghanistan. He was a scout sniper. He's a good kid. I, I just saw him last week, at, last Tuesday. And I'm thinking to myself, so if Junior had been on the beach drinking Mai Tais for four years, you would say the, literally the exact same thing. How does that make any sense? Uh, so, but, and the other side of the coin is my story, which is, you're exposed to a lot of things and you're put in charge of a lot of things at such a young age. I mean, I look back now and how young I was. I mean, I was a 20-year-old corporal in charge of 13 people, everything in their life. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. And uh, it was, and, and now you come out and it's like, you know, my, I look at my friends and, you know, they might, they're super successful people at very recognizable companies and they're in charge of like three people, you know? It's like, we're 35, and so it's like we, I had this unrealistic expectation of what the world, what, the, what I could do, and the world had an unrealistic expectation, and we just, we're just not even close. It's like not even close. So it, it's hard. I mean, that's why I went to see a therapist. That's why I'm standing here in front of you. That's, that's, why, that's why I tell you it's hard. If it was easy, again, no one would be sitting here listening, and I wouldn't be talking. All right, I think we have, maybe have time for one last question. Last one. I, I really enjoyed hearing a lot about the history of the plague and, and the military history of the faculty and, and of, the, of the people and kids that were here. And it, it reminds me of what I love about the plague, where that many came from. Um, I'm wondering if when you talked to the kids last week, or a couple of years ago, remember, did any of those kids indicate an interest in military academies? Uh, so the question was, you know, the past Blake military history and then the current uh, Blake kind of military connection. Uh, coincidentally enough, last night I was at dinner, at a, sadly, at a funeral uh, with three other Marine officers. Stuart Howell, who flies Marine One, the president around, he's a lieutenant colonel now. Uh, ben Hahn, who was a lieutenant and uh, he was a communications officer and Andy Boreen, and they were all a few years older than myself. Um, and they, we've, we've maintained a steady bond. It was funny, Stuart, who's still in the Marines, walked over to me last night, and I could tell he just needed a, a second of relief from uh, you know, schmoozing people, and he just started dropping F-bombs to me. I mean, it was just like, F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. And I was like, yeah, he just felt comfortable because he knew who I was, and, and that's the relationship we have. Um, so. I think you've seen some people join the service, and I think not a lot of people do the enlisted side. I, I don't know if I'd recommend it for everyone. I, it worked for me, kind of coincidentally and, and whatnot, but I think Blake students should probably be officers, typically. Um, I, we did talk to a woman last, 
on Tuesday she came down and she was talking about her desire to go to one of the service academies. She, she kept saying West Point and I kept saying, are you sure? So <laughs> finally, it was about four iterations of that. Um, and I said, I'll introduce you to some Naval Academy people so you can be a Marine. But uh, so I, I do think there's interest and I think going back and you know, I followed up with Mr. Mengi's, Paul Mengi gave me great feedback and I said, well, just call me in three years. You know, when the school turns over again, and uh, and I'll talk to them. So again, don't encourage people to join. I discourage as many people as I encourage, but I think it's a, a choice for each person, and and if it's a reflection of you, you know, the Marine Corps is a reflection of who I was and what type of person I was growing up. Even even Brad Schinkel in the back will tell you that you know he brought me up north to this camp, uh, 30 days in the woods, kind of by yourself type of camp that I attended with Brian Schenko, who's sitting here now. You know, I loved it. it was, is that, you know, I joined the Marines. Some people say because of that, some people say I loved it. I think the point being is it was part of who I was and who I still am and, and what I'm good at. And, and I didn't mention this, but I would have stayed in the Marine. I, I loved the Marine Corps, but something about going to war was not too kind on relationships. And, and I'll stand up here and say, I don't basically know no infantry officers that are happily married. Pers anecdotally, I know none. They've all been divorced or have unhappy marriages. It is extraordinarily difficult, especially during this time of war, where it's just deployment. Because if you're an infantry officer in the Marine Corps, the number one focus you should have is your Marines. And I, I know that sounds crass or, or rude to spouses, but um, it's not rude to the parents of those kids that you're leading in combat. So uh, I think most Marine infantry officers choose that and their, their relationship suffers. So I left active duty because of that. Like I said, I still get to do the reserve thing. I was in uh, the Netherlands on a UN exercise last summer. The summer before that, I was in the Dominican Republic. I was asked to go to Morocco this year, but I said I don't want to do another overseas one. So I'm going to Indiana here in a couple of weeks to just kind of hang out. It'll be fun. Uh, so, but yes, the short answer is Blake kids are interested. Um, so I think that, that wraps up questions. I really appreciate you guys coming out, and I really appreciate Rod uh, coming and giving my introduction. He's the best. So thanks, Rod. Thank you, Nick. Join us September 1st for uh, the State of the Blake Schools with Ann Stabby. Thanks for joining us.